The iMac Pro is by far the most powerful computer I have ever owned. Now, to be fair, I have really only owned about three Macs in my life, two of which are now iMacs, the 2012 iMac, and now the 2017 iMac Pro. Before that, I used a custom-built gaming PC to edit videos for a while, then I made the switch up to my 15-inch MacBook Pro, and the main reason I keep going back to Macs, and it's not just because I'm an Apple sheep, but my roots of being kind of very loyal to Apple always came from the Mac lineup because that's what I've had the most experience with. Ever since I was a little kid, I used Apple computers and I still have the family computers in the studio today. The reason I kept coming back to Apple is because they had a reputation for always being fast and always being reliable and just really cool to look at. And I think that the iMac Pro holds up in 2017 and now 2018 as how all Apple computers have stood up for me for the past two decades I've been alive. So just looking at it from a pure aesthetic point, I am totally satisfied with the way it looks. Sure, I would take some smaller bezels if they're looking for upgrades to make. I could use a smaller chin if they wanted to make a same size bezel all the way around. Yeah, there's ways it could look better, but just this very familiar design that I'm very accustomed to with my old 2012 iMac, rethought of as this extremely thin, and from most angles, it doesn't even look like it has any kind of width to it. It just looks like a floating display, and now to see that in glorious space gray is just so overly satisfying satisfying because like I say in my videos, I love it when Apple makes more colors. I think Apple should always have more colors for things. There's not nearly enough color options now. I would love to see a gold and rose gold iMac. I wouldn't buy it per chance, but I just think there should be lots of colors of things. Product red, matte black. I love different colors of things and to finally see that me being a guy who kind of goes for the space gray ecosystem is now being treated with if you want a space gray Apple desktop, you got to get the top of the line one, the pro desktop one, and it just so happened that with the camera camera enhancements like the Blackmagic camera I'm filming this on and filming most of Telosa videos on now, I needed something more powerful than my MacBook Pro to be able to edit that footage and the iMac Pro does it well. There's only so many ways you can say that this thing is fast. This thing is fast, this thing is fast, and this thing is fast. That's about three. I could keep going. But all joking aside, I can load my 4K footage at 60 FPS video as you're seeing in this video today into Final Cut Pro and experience no lag. I have the mode activated on Final Cut Pro where it does not need to pre-render footage before you watch it because a lot of people bring up that if you just throw footage into a Mac really quickly and you start watching things, things can get pretty choppy. I don't have that mode turned on. This is just the raw computing power. No rendering necessary and it can still handle it like a champ. That GPU and CPU working together do an excellent job. And I've had friends with 5K iMacs in the past and one thing I was worried about with the iMac Pro was that usually when I started exporting something on my friend's iMac while looking very thin and while looking looking very cool on their desk, it would start to get hot very quickly and there was just really one fan in that old iMac that would keep the whole thing cool and it would sound like an airliner taking off when you started doing power intensive things. It would get loud and then it would just be awkward because there's this really pretty thing sitting at your desk but you're hearing this very, very annoying sound that's like, iMac, are you okay? And I cannot give enough credit to Apple. When they designed this iMac Pro, they kept sound in mind, both with keeping the fans extremely quiet because even if I'm my mining Bitcoin on this computer while doing other tasks, it's almost impossible to hear the fans. I think maybe one time while mining Bitcoin and exporting a 4K at 60 FPS video at the same time, I was just barely able to pick up the fact that the fans were actually running. So they are there. My fans aren't broken or anything, but they're definitely extremely, extremely quiet. While at the same time, Apple redesigned the sound system in the iMac Pro to be way louder than any other iMac I've ever heard. With the previous generation 5K iMac, the sound was pretty good. I remember my friends being being able to listen to stuff on there pretty decently. But when Apple said they redesigned the built-in speakers on the iMac Pro, I didn't realize it was to this caliber. There are subwoofers in the top part of the iMac Pro. If you watch a teardown video, you can actually see that there are speakers at the bottom of the iMac as usual, but also at the top, there's these subwoofer devices and they give off this incredible bass. And it's very hard to deliver sound audio over the internet because you're all listening to this on different headphones and speakers. But what I can say is that this giant room that is now the tech room, uh, it fills it up pretty good. <laughs> if 
if I had to describe it in a way, I would say it's just a couple notches quieter and a couple notches less clear than a Google Home Max, which is an incredibly loud speaker. I love my Google Home Max. iMac Pro is not far behind it. Incredibly loud, incredibly clear, and for built-in speakers, it's definitely the best I've ever heard. When I started playing things on it, I was like, whoa, is this real? Is this actually happening? I also love that to complement this new space gray design, we have our exclusive space gray trackpad, mouse, and keyboard, which look amazing and complement very well to someone who's constantly trying to complete their space gray ecosystem. I lucked out this time that Apple actually favored the space gray people. A lot of the time people may act like, come on, Drew, it's just a keyboard and mouse, but the iMac Pro does not have a touchscreen like a Surface Studio, so really the only way you interact with it is with that keyboard and mouse, and I think designing those things well is a very, very important part of the process. Now, most people bring up the Magic Mouse 2. It does have a very awkward and stupid placement for the lightning port. I agree with that, though I don't really know of a better place to put it. They could put it on the front, but then that would interfere with the clean, overarching look of the Magic Mouse, and I really don't want them to mess with that. And besides, in all the time I've been using my iMac Pro for editing all these videos, editing videos before the Black Magic camera got here, I've never had to charge the mouse yet. So while I know eventually I'll have to charge the mouse, I at least know that it's not for very long and it's not very often. So Apple probably just thought, we don't want to have double A's anymore. We want it to be charged and you only have to charge it once a month for what, a couple hours or maybe not even that? In that case, it's not too much of a burden. It's a weird charging place, yes, but I can't think of a better one. And besides, you're not going to plug it in very often anyway. I love that Magic Keyboard as well, but I kind of wish they made a smaller version of it because I find myself never really using the numeric pad. I get that it's for professionals and stuff, but I would be perfectly fine with the smaller version, which I don't believe was an option when checking out the iMac Pro. I messed around with the Magic Trackpad 2 for a while because I had reviewed one a couple years back, but I hadn't really used one since then, and I thought I would try to do it again. It's cool, but maybe it's something about the fact that it's just a little bit bigger than my MacBook Pro's trackpad. There's something about it I just find limiting. It's really cool that you can do the multi-touch gestures and stuff and swipe up with four fingers, swipe to the side and do two finger gestures, and it's really cool for editing and stuff like that, but the main reason I got it was because I knew I could never get a space gray one again, unless I bought a whole new iMac Pro, so I was like, Drew, make sure you get it this time, but definitely decided I don't really need it, so I'm selling it to a fan who has contacted me and made an offer on it. So now that I've filmed it for this review, it is probably going to be shipped to that fan very soon. Again, cool trackpad, just not really for me. I've kind of gotten used to trackpads a lot with my MacBook Pro, and I found out that I still really prefer the mice. I think that is a method of user interface that really works better for me anyway, so I'm gonna stick with that and hopefully lower this insanely expensive device price point by selling that magic trackpad to a fan who is interested in using it and having a space gray one, which is very hard to get your hands on. Now, a lot of people know that I am kind of the forward-thinking Apple sheep almost to an arrogant point because I'm always like, remove the headphone jack, remove traditional USB ports, go all in on USB-C or go all in on wireless. And a lot of people have asked me what I think about the fact that the iMac Pro has a lot of old legacy ports. Four traditional USB ports, brings back the SD card slot, which the MacBook Pro did not have. Of course, keeps the headphone jack, but it even keeps 10 gigabit ethernet. What I can say is that because a lot of companies like to send me small parts and accessories. It's kind of nice that the iMac Pro has all those old ports because I don't really buy all of these products like the Apple Pencil charger stand or a gaming mouse or my CFast card reader, my iPhone 10 charging stand and an Apple Watch charging stand. All of these things that kind of have USB regular built into them. I don't really want to go find a five watt charge brick for each and every one of them. So it makes sense that I just take up all of the old traditional ports on the iMac Pro with that. Since my desk raises and goes down, it would be more complicated complicated to have them plugged in from the floor because then when I raise the desk up, all of the charging accessories would fall off. So it actually makes sense to keep all of them charging connected to the iMac Pro because then when the desk goes up, the cables go up as well. And that also means that the USB-C ports are still free for when I use my portable hard drive and all of my other USB-C accessories out there. There's still leftover ports. And as we found out when I recorded a Talos of Talks podcast today that ended up being 450 gigabytes, I may have to be investing in a Thunderbolt 3 external drive drive very soon. I got the two terabyte version, which was a really smart idea because I film a lot of footage that takes up a lot of space now. It didn't take long for me to fill up the two terabytes, but when I started offloading all of that data onto an old style regular USB hard drive, an eight terabyte Western digital one that I use for like basic deep storage, it took a long, long time to transfer. Even with the iMac Pro's really good processor, it's all bottlenecked by that USB 3.0 port. So I'm definitely looking now for Thunderbolt 3 external hard drives if you guys have any recommendations.
destinations for deep storage and fast, very, very fast offloading storage, then please let me know in the comments below. I'd be happy to review one and see what you guys recommend. I'm guessing a lot of you probably know a lot more about it than I do. Having the SD card slot back is kind of nice. It means I don't have to use the adapter anymore, but I think the main reason they ditched it on the MacBook was for the sake of having as minimal ports on there as possible because on a MacBook Pro, getting things thin, getting things light, and as basic as possible, I think was more important when designing it. Whereas the iMac Pro is this giant device and very heavy device. They're not worried about portability. I think slapping the old ports on there is not too hard and it doesn't interfere with what the designers are going for anyway. So I guess it makes sense. I could still live without it. But what is nice is now that when I'm filming on these Blackmagic cameras, I'm recording to CFast cards now, not SD cards. So I have to use an adapter anyway, no matter what device I'm using. Never seen a Mac with a CFast card plugged into it. But what it means is since my microphone records to an SD card, I can be importing my video and my audio at the same time. So for that, I will say it is kind of nice and my MacBook Pro can't do that. But I still think that MacBook Pros should stay all in on USB-C and other companies should really start working on wireless data transfer. I would like to see cameras and microphones all get to a point where we can wirelessly send data. And I want to keep reminding you of that with the iMac Pro. While I may be using old traditional ports just because I have these old charge accessories for my phone and Apple Pencil and all of this stuff on the desk, still most of the time I'm not touching the iMac or interacting with it at all. My keyboard and mouse are wireless and when I'm listening to music or I'm editing a video even, I use AirPods. It's so, so, so easy that I can walk up to my Mac, hit the space bar, it turns on and because I'm wearing an Apple Watch, my Apple Watch can unlock the iMac. And for the first time now, I can see that you can have that enabled on multiple Mac computers. So now my watch, if I'm wearing it and it's unlocked, it can unlock my iMac Pro and my MacBook Pro, which are both on my desk. That's been very convenient because it means I don't have to type in passwords anymore. And there's even been other times where I may be on the other side of the room on the couch watching a movie or something. My sister comes over and she's like, let me do something on your computer. What's the password? She tapped the space bar and then because I had my Apple Watch on and I was not too far away from the Mac, it just unlocked and she went, oh, never mind. And I'll say what you will about privacy, but I have nothing to hide on there. So I was just like, hey, I didn't have to tell her my password. So that part got to stay secure. And because she needed to get on the computer for her homework, she got to have access to it because the computer knew I was in range of it. And even with Windows, hello, that's not an option because you have to be looking at the device for it to unlock. Now, of course, it wouldn't be a desktop review if you didn't talk a little bit about gaming performance, especially when you've got some pretty heavy duty GPUs as the iMac Pro does. We finally figured out how to boot Windows 10 onto the iMac Pro and we ran some games on it. Amazingly good performance. The fact that we can run GTA 5 at a 5K resolution. And I will add that the frame rates did not drop much at all. Stayed at a solid 60. Sometimes if you were doing something fancy, it could start to die down. And it definitely shows that boot camp on Mac is not completely optimized for Windows 10. So certain apps will open and not be sized correctly. Most games, when you first install them, default to the lowest resolution and you have to turn them up. There's a lot of driver issues with certain games like in GTA 5, my driving sucks. I think that was the driver joke. I was trying to make. There's some joke there. Someone can fix that pun. But in GTA 5, there would be audio problems, like things would get muffly. Certain games won't load correctly. So while I definitely say if you buy an iMac Pro, you're definitely probably not buying it for gaming. You can game on it when it works and probably when you give it some time down the road when the iMac Pro has been out for a while, there will be more support for these versions of graphics cards. Because as of right now, certain games like Doom don't work. But when games do work, they load great. I can play Wolfenstein 2 at 5 5K at around 40 to 50 FPS, and that's with the graphical settings turned up all the way. Gameplay just looks insanely good and almost a little too good that with that 5K retina display, you can see every little detail of the game design. It starts to make things look almost fake. But speaking of fake, I also used Windows 10 edition of Minecraft just because why not and found out that on my computer, you can actually load up to 60 chunks away. And of course, this game is playing 5K at 60 and you can see as far as the eye can see in that Minecraft map and there's barely any frames drop, which was really cool because I didn't know that you could turn video settings up to 60 chunks in Minecraft before. I was like, whoa, they designed it to do that? So that was impressive. And some people ask about Bitcoin mining, which is something I've also tried with the iMac Pro. And it depends on what kind of tasks you're doing, but I was able to get my iMac Pro at a couple times up to 1.5 kilo hashes a second, which was really, really cool because that's quite a high hash rate for one computer. I'm sure there's gaming PCs that can do it better. I know they're out there, but 
I'm just saying for a Mac that doesn't have an Nvidia graphics card, I thought that was pretty good. In terms of video editing, I'm very satisfied that it can handle 4K at 60 footage like butter. And also I mentioned earlier, we're filming 4K podcasts on the Talos of Talks channel and it can handle multi-angle editing just fine. Handling, you know, hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes of footage at once, we go in and color correct one shot or we change the brightness of one shot and no frames are dropped. And you can still watch all three angles of 4K footage at full frames and it works flawlessly. And I love that. I love that I finally have a machine that's just like, you can throw anything you want at this and it will be fine. So Apple even highlighted briefly that the 1080p camera on it is a little bit better. Of course, it still is a webcam, so it doesn't look amazing, but I definitely noticed the resolution boost and when I'm live streaming on the gaming channel, I can tell that it's kind of an FPS jump. It's capable of live streaming at higher frame rates and I don't think the microphone sounds that bad for a built-in microphone. And most webcams usually aren't good at that, but I did a handful of live streams on the Talos of Gaming channel with the iMac Pro and a lot of people were impressed during the live stream, which by the way, I was able to live stream gameplay at 2K at 60 FPS playing Rocket League, which was pretty cool. I don't know a lot of gaming streams that go to 2K at 60, but YouTube does support it. And people said that the webcam looked really good and that the microphone quality was also decently good. I didn't have any microphone plugged into it. It was just the onboard mic and people were satisfied with it. That's all I needed. So overall, it's safe to say that without surprise, the Apple Sheep really, really likes the iMac Pro. But of course, the most common thing brought up with the iMac Pro is Drew, how do you feel about the fact that there is a new Mac Pro? So just a tower station coming out this year or at the beginning of next year. And the fact of the matter is, I think that I bought the computer that was perfect for the type of stuff I was doing. For the people watching this who are saying, Drew, you paid way too much on that computer. No one ever needs that much stuff or that's way too expensive. For you, perhaps. Perhaps you can get by with something much smaller and I think that's great. What I think I did was buy the right machine for the right job. I probably could have bought some regular maxed out 5K iMac and have it edit the black magic footage just fine. But when I buy computers, I like to imagine where I'm going to go with them down the road. And I think that this computer will be able to edit all the footage I record on this black magic just fine. And perhaps if I make an even bigger camera upgrade at some point in the next few years, I think it would probably be able to handle it just fine as well. I think if we get to the point where this iMac Pro now has a CPU and GPU that is not fast enough, I'll be filming on cameras that cost way more money than this is worth. And if I can afford those cameras, I'm sure I can afford a new computer. So that's why I was okay with buying this. I know it's not that upgradable, but I've never ran into a situation in which 32 gigs of RAM is not enough, so far at least. And I've been doing a lot of stuff on here and I haven't run into a situation in which the eight cores that it has is not enough or the GPU it has has not been enough. Right now, everything's been overkill and I know that there will be tougher and tougher stuff it has to handle over time, but I think it's safe to say that because it's all solid state, there's not a lot of moving parts, it's going to last quite a while. And I think it's easily going to last the next four or five, maybe even six years before I need to make an entire desktop upgrade. Now, because this is Talos of Tech and I review Apple computers and I'm an Apple sheep, it's very, very possible that I might be buying the modular Mac Pro because I need to review it anyway. Maybe not necessarily I need it, but you guys will be curious about it and perhaps I'll be able to afford it at some point in the future. But as for what I absolutely need, I think that the iMac Pro is a great purchase because my laptop was not cutting it in terms of storage and processing power necessary to handle this type of footage. Now the iMac Pro can handle it just fine and it can do a ton of other stuff just fine. It can even do VR stuff if I ever want to experiment with an HTC Vive. Not anytime soon, but I just like knowing that that's an option. Speakers blew me away. It was incredible. Graphical performance is completely overkill. Microphone's really good. Webcam's decent. Design elements just look wonderful. And that's all I can say about this machine is that I love it. I literally have no complaints about it other than like, sure, shrink the bezels a little bit. That's really all I have to recommend to future generations of the iMac. I'd be happy if it were cheaper too. But again, I'm okay with paying top dollar for this thing because of what it does for me and the fact that I use this on a daily basis and I love that it saves so much time when exporting tech videos and podcasts. It can just crank things out, not even get hot, and it makes my video editing experiences as smooth as possible. And that's really all you can ask for in a computer. So let me know what you think of the iMac Pro. I've been loving mine. If you have one, let me know how you've been experiencing it. And you know, if you're thinking about getting one, just know that you have my personal recommendation. Make sure that you're buying it because you're truly going to use all of its features. I've heard of certain photographers buying maxed out iMac Pros and I just have to say, I don't think that's necessary. There's certain people who definitely don't need this much power. I think I did though. So for me, I thought it made sense, not for everyone, but for probably mostly filmmakers out there, I think it is the most useful. This is your Apple Sheep here and I will see you in the next one.